Kamchatka Peninsula, Russia, 1980s. This story involved an all-out fight between an attacking grizzly bear and a female Sasquatch. Frank was on a trophy bear hunt with guides. The guides knew there were Bigfoot in the area, but regularly hunted the bears in that region. One of the guides told Frank a tale about a big battle that occurred between a female Bigfoot and a grizzly. The grizzly, or brown bear, apparently charged or somehow attacked the female Bigfoot, and the male Bigfoot came to her aid. Frank said the area of the confrontation was about an acre in size, and it looked like two bulldozers had gone at it. The trackers refused to track the Bigfoot, but they did track down the grizzly. It was harvested. In the course of tracking that bear down on snowmobiles, the men wandered away from them. Upon returning, they found a snow machine had been thrown down an embankment. Frank's guide skinned hundreds of bears in his time. He was surprised to see large teeth marks on the back of the bear hide once it was skinned. They deduced the male Bigfoot jumped the bear from behind and bit into its neck in defense of the female Bigfoot. The Pamir Mountains, lying in a remote region where the borders of Tajikistan, China, Kashmir, and Afghanistan meet, have been the scene of many Bigfoot sightings. The Russian word for Bigfoot is Almas. Mikhail Stefanovich Topilsky, a major general in the Soviet army, led his unit in an assault on an anti-Soviet guerrilla force hiding in a cave in the Pamirs. One of the surviving guerrillas said that while in the cave, he and his comrades were attacked by several ape-like creatures. Topilsky ordered the rubble of the cave searched, and the body of one such creature was found. Topilsky reported, At first glance, I thought the body was that of an ape. It was covered with hair all over, but I knew there were no apes in the Pamirs. Also, the body itself looked very much like that of a man. We tried pulling the hair to see if it was just a hide used for disguise, but found that it was the creature's own natural hair. We turned the body over several times on its back and its front and measured it. The body, continued Topilsky, belonged to a male creature, about five and a half feet tall, elderly or even old, judging by the grayish color of the hair in several places. The chest was covered with brownish hair and the belly with grayish hair. The hair was longer but sparser on the chest and close cropped and thick on the belly. In general, the hair was very thick, without any underfur. There was the least hair on the buttocks, from which fact our doctor deduced that the creature sat like a human being. There was most hair on the hips. The knees were completely bare of hair and had callous growths on them. The whole foot, including the sole, was quite hairless and was covered by hard brown skin. The hair got thinner near the hand and the palms had none at all, but only callous skin. Topilsky added, the color of the face was dark, and the creature had neither beard nor mustache. The temples were bald, and the back of the head was covered with thick, matted hair. The dead creature lay with its eyes open and its teeth bared. The eyes were dark, and the teeth were large and even and shaped like human teeth. The forehead was slanting, and the eyebrows were very powerful. The protruding jawbones made the face resemble the Mongol type of face. The nose was flat with a deeply sunk bridge. The ears were hairless and looked a little more pointed than a human being's with a longer lobe. The lower jaw was very massive. The creature had a very powerful chest and well-developed muscles. The arms were of normal length, the hands were slightly wider, and the feet much wider and shorter than man's. Caucasus Mountains, 1941 V.S. Karapetian, a lieutenant colonel of the medical service of the Soviet Army, performed a direct physical examination of a living wild man captured in the Dagestan Autonomous Republic just north of the Caucasus Mountains. Karapetian said, I entered a shed with two members of the local authorities. When I asked why I had to examine the man in a cold shed and not in a warm room, I was told that the prisoner could not be kept in a warm room. He had sweated in the house so profusely that they had to keep him in the shed. I can still see the creature as it stood before me, a male, naked, and barefooted, and it was doubtlessly a man because its entire shape was human. The chest, back, and shoulders, however, were covered with shaggy hair of a dark brown color. This fur of his was much like that of a bear, and one inch long. The fur was thinner and softer below the chest. 
His wrists were crude and sparsely covered with hair. The palms of his hands and soles of his feet were bare of hair. Pamirs, 1957 Alexander Georgievich Prodan, a hydrologist at the Geographical Research Institute of Leningrad University, participated in an expedition to the Pamirs for the purpose of mapping glaciers. On August 2, 1957, while his team was investigating the Fajenko Glacier, Pronin hiked into the valley of the Balyankeek River. At noon, he noticed a figure standing on a rocky cliff about 500 yards above him and the same distance away. His first reaction was surprise, since this area was known to be uninhabited, and his second was that the creature was not human. It resembled a man, but was very stooped. He watched the stocky figure move across the snow, keeping its feet wide apart, and he noticed that its forearms were longer than a human's, and it was covered with reddish-gray hair. Pronin saw the creature again three days later, walking upright. Since this incident, there have been numerous wildman sightings in the Pamirs, and members of various expeditions have photographed them. The Caucasus Region According to testimony from villagers of Takina on the Mokvi River, a female almas was captured there during the 19th century in the forests of Mount Zaydan. For three years, she was kept imprisoned, but then became domesticated and was allowed to live in a house. She was called Zaina. Her skin was a grayish-black color, covered with reddish hair, longer on her head than elsewhere. She was capable of inarticulate cries, but never developed a language. She had a large face with big cheekbones, muzzle-like prognathous jaw and large eyebrows, big white teeth and a fierce expression. Eventually, Zena, through sexual relations with a villager, had children. Some of Zena's grandchildren were seen by Boris Porshnev in 1964. The grandchildren, Chilakau and Tai, had darkish skin of rather negroid appearance, with very prominent chins. Near Salt Lake Basanchuk, Russia. From Michael Trachtengertz. This autumn, I visited a place of observation near Salt Lake Basanchek in the east part of the Astrakhan region. It lays among endless steppes, and a new nature reserve was recently established there. A few months ago, I got a following observation message from the supervising ranger of the reserve, A. Andrasov, that had occurred two years ago in 1998. During patrolling in the 1st of October in Surikov's ravine, I have seen somebody by my own eyes. I cannot tell at all what it is. I lowered on a motorcycle from a road to the bottom of the ravine. From a dam, I have noticed something reminding of a man. It was escaping and partially latent from me by branches of trees and bushes. As it ran through a bush, the crash of branches was heard. I had stopped under an apple tree and began to collect apples. After seven to eight minutes had passed, I heard a rustle somewhere behind me. I had turned to one side and to another and had seen it again. At this time, the creature sat squatted. Having advanced, the hip was raised strongly with the hands rested against the ground before it. Eyes, black, such as in films of horrors were shown. Terrible as though emptiness was in there. Softly speaking, they were ugly. As I've understood, it observed me, but there was no sounds or anything else was made. As soon as I have turned to it, it simply has disappeared. It disappeared sharply. It was here now and in an instant was not present. It might be for my fear, so it seemed. I could not see it completely. When I turned back my head, it escaped in bushes. It was all covered by hair and higher than me. I'm a meter and 82 centimeters high. 5 foot 11 inches. The coloring was brown-gray, but not light. Such dark. After one of its disappearances, I have seized a bag and ran from there. After this meeting, I feel horror in the place, especially when weather reminds me what was then. A strong wind and clouds from time to time are closing the sun. My friend, M. Kirikajan, his student, and I went to the place in similar season and hoped to see the creature. At this time, there are a lot of fruits, hawthorn, sweetbriar, wild apples, and pears. Here, there are excellent opportunities for shelter in large and small caves to the north and the south of the lake, Lake Karst Fields. There is fresh water in the depth, and we use it to prepare our meals. 
For the week we were there, not any attributes of hominoid presence had been found out. We explored the sandy coast of the lake and dusty, steep roads, saw many tracks of antelopes, foxes, wolves, and small animals, but not of our essence. The weather was warm, and we feel no anxiety with our tents just near to the apple tree. Michael Trachtengertz, Moscow, Russia 1980. A worker at an experimental agricultural station operated by the Mongolian Academy of Sciences at Bulgan encountered the dead body of a wild man. I approached and saw a hairy corpse of a robust human-like creature, dried and half-buried by sand. I had never seen such a human-like being before, covered by camel-color, brownish-yellow short hairs, and I recoiled, although in my native land in Shengshang I had seen many dead men killed in battle. The dead thing was not a bear or ape, and at the same time it was not a man like Mongol or Kazakh or Chinese and Russian. The hairs of its head were longer than on its body. 1963. Ivan Ivlov, a Russian pediatrician, was traveling through the Altai Mountains in the southern part of Mongolia. Ivlov saw several human-like creatures standing on a mountain slope. They appeared to be a family group composed of a male, female, and child. Ivlov observed these creatures through his binoculars from a distance of half a mile until they moved out of his field of vision. His Mongolian driver also saw them and said they were common in that area. There is no reason to doubt Ivlov's word, partly because of his impeccable scientific reputation and partly because, although he had heard local stories about these creatures, he had remained skeptical about their existence. After his encounter with the Almas family, Ivlov interviewed many Mongolian children, believing they would be more candid than adults. The children provided many additional reports about the Almas. For example, one child told Ivlov that while he and some other children were swimming in a stream, he saw a male Almas carry a child Almas across it. 1937. Dorji Mirin, a member of the Mongolian Academy of Scientists, saw the skin of an almas in a monastery in the Gobi Desert. The lamas were using it as a carpet in some of their rituals. The hairs on the skin were reddish and curly. The features of the face were hairless. The face had eyebrows, and the head still had long, disordered hair. Fingers and toes were in a good state of preservation, and the nails were similar to human nails. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.